Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership Through Crisis series, where we will connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important questions to help us navigate through rough waters. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Today, we're speaking with Arielle Garten, co-founder of the breakthrough technology, Muse. She is probably one of the most interesting people you will meet. She's a psychotherapist, neuroscientist, mom, former fashion designer, and the female founder and visionary of an amazing and highly successful tech startup, Muse. When Ariel is not reading brains, literally, or investing in, inspiring, and advising other startups and women in biz, you can find her on stages across the world, from TED to MIT to South by Southwest. She inspires people to understand that they can accomplish anything they want by learning what goes on in their own mind. Ariel is also the co-host of the Untangle podcast. Welcome, Ariel Garten. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm doing well. We're so happy to have you on our podcast. Are you ready to point to our listeners? I am ready. Awesome. Now, can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? Sure. So I was told I was a born leader, which might be code for I was a little bit bossy when I was younger. <laughs> but I always really had an idea of what I wanted to do. And I was able to engage people to do it with me. And when I was younger, I you know, was in positions like designer of the fashion show or, you know, director of plays, things that allowed me to kind of practice organizing people to do a thing. When I went to school, it was for neuroscience, but at the same time, I had a little clothing line and then I became a clothing designer with the store in Toronto and I had an endless stream of interns because I didn't have a lot of money. So I would have interns who would come and help me both create the clothing as well as run the store. And so I really became good at encouraging and developing people in exchange for being able to work together. And that was, you know, maybe the second part of leadership. To me, the first part of leadership was having an idea and getting people to do it. The second part is developing people through the course of doing it. But at that point, I still was not a great leader. I still didn't understand how to really give people the space to do what they needed to do to flourish as themselves within the confines of the project that I wanted done. It was definitely a fault in my leadership. And then I founded a company called Muse. We make a brain sensing headband that helps you meditate. And it's a, now a startup of 40 people. We sell all around the world, hundreds of thousands of users. And I was the CEO of that company for seven years. So having never actually worked for another company, I became the CEO of my own company, leading a team of 40 people to create this completely novel product, take it to market and really spread it all around the world. So I've had a lot of opportunities to be a leader. I'm now a mother, which is a different kind of leader. Oh, yes. <laughs> that primes your leadership, doesn't it? Like nothing else. It primes your leadership and then also informs your leadership. Yeah. There's all sorts of skills to you know, get your family team to do things with you um, <laughs> that, that you then realize are perfectly applicable and all sorts of understanding of an individual's will and desires and how to work with it rather than against it. This is so interesting. You're a neuroscientist, a clothing designer, and you've created Muse. Now, what does Muse do? I mean, it's so interesting. It's a brain sensing headband. Tell us about that technology. How did you come sure. up with that? So what Muse does is it gives you real-time feedback on your meditation. We all know that meditation is good for you and particularly great for leadership, but meditation is really hard to do. And there's nobody sitting inside your head, letting you know what's going on when you're in the meditation zone and telling you that you're doing it right. 
And so through my experience in neuroscience, I began working with this early uh, brain computer interface technology and recognized that it could really fundamentally help solve the problem of meditation. It's able to track your brain during meditation, give you real time feedback to know when you're focused and when your mind is wandering. So the metaphor we use is your mind is like the weather. When you're thinking and distracted, you can actually hear it as stormy. It translates your brain activity into guiding sounds just by connecting to oh, an app wow. on your phone. And then as you come to quiet, focused attention, you actually hear the storm quiet. So you're literally hearing what's going on inside your own mind. And then after the fact, you get data, charts, graphs, scores, things that show you what your mind was doing during your meditation to help you both learn the practice. So we have lots of beginning meditators who've never meditated before and they start using these. They're like, wow, that's how you meditate. I got it. <laughs> and also for experts to really give you a new insight into your meditation process. Well, I need one or more of those. <laughs> Where can I get this? So it's actually been in market since 2014 and you can get it on Amazon or our website, choosemuse.com. And then it's also used at clinics all over the world. Mayo Clinic has been using it with breast cancer patients awaiting surgery to help decrease the stress of surgery. Um, we have lots of doctors, psychotherapists, coaches, and also educators that use it. So choosemuse.com is the best way. Okay. Okay. Follow me on Instagram. It's Ariel's Musings and at Choose Muse. And, you know, our mission is to really help people understand what goes on inside their head and learn the skills required to manage their own mental space, to be able to calm the mind, calm the body, focus the thoughts, and now help people sleep. We have a new device that's just come out, Muse S, that gives you real-time feedback before you fall asleep to help guide you into sleep and sleep more peacefully. Mm, and that's so helpful, especially nowadays when the stress level is so high and people are losing sleep. And, you know, during the time of this interview, we're at hopefully the tail end of this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, how has that affected you, your family, your business? It's affected it significantly in some positive ways. I mean, we have more people meditating now than we've ever had before. People are using device over and over again. People are sharing it with others in their household so they can all get the benefits of meditation. We're seeing the kind of content that people are consuming really change um, as we have hundreds of guided meditations and we're seeing people use things like calm the mind and finding the path through uncertainty as, as their top things that they're interested in. On a personal perspective, I mean, I have been working from home since March 15th. I'm here with my three-year-old. And so, and always, my heart is so incredibly heavy for the world and people's losses and the difficulties and the economic impact has been startling. My husband's career has been, been impacted. Everybody's feeling the impact. On the other hand, the pandemic has also given us extraordinary blessings. Mm -hmm. I was just speaking to my cousin in California who now gets to work from home. She lives in a remote community and her stress levels have decreased dramatically and she's able to focus on spending time with herself. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm here with my child and rather than him being at preschool or with a babysitter or nanny, I spend 24 hours a day with him now and it is the greatest gift I could have ever gotten. Mm -hmm. The greatest gift. You know, I think about all the things that I was missing in those moments when I wasn't with him mm -hmm. and, and I'm just, I'm savoring every second that I have now. Yeah, and you know, um, a lot of people are also feeling the same things in that they're not going back to their typical way of working. They're staying home or they're deciding to stay home and really practicing self-care. So this is very timely. Thank you so much. Now, Ariel, what quotes or advice has helped you most during this crisis? One of my favorite quotes is, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And so in the pandemic, it's very easy to get your anxiety ramped up and to just exist in, in anxiety. And for me, it's been important to remember that when I'm inside my home, when I am you know, here doing my work, I'm actually really safe. And I don't have to be afraid of the sensation of fear. I don't have to be afraid of the unknown. It just, mm -hmm. it is. And so I've been really focusing on enjoying the life that I have rather than being caught up in the fear. Mm -hmm. Another quote that has been very useful actually came from my husband very early on in the pandemic. He said, to quote, 
lower your expectations, lower the bar. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for the first few weeks that became like, the, we'd check in with each other. It's like, the kid's only been on the tablet for two hours. He needs to get off right now because, you know, it's going to be terrible if you watch this 10 more minutes. It's like, lower your expectations. It will be okay. okay. <laughs> lower the bar. <laughs> well, that's great advice. And certainly I can relate to that because at the beginning, I understand the expectations were high and we were all adjusting. And so we also had to give a lot of grace to people, to each other. So lower the bar, lower, you know, lower your expectations, but also increase your grace the grace that yeah. you give people. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Hey leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Do you get headaches or don't feel quite right after a glass or two of wine? Well, you're not alone. I recently discovered organic clean crafted wines that are a game changer for me. Scout and Cellar has a clean crafted commitment to ensure that they produce wines without synthetic chemicals as they take care of the earth in the process. I can now enjoy wine without any adverse effects. Visit scoutandcellar.com forward slash lily. That's S-C-O-U-T-A-N-D-C-E-L-L-A-R dot com forward slash L-I-L-Y and learn more about these delicious wines. You'll be glad you did. Great leaders deserve great wines. Many use the term lifelong learner. What does that mean to you? And what are you learning right now? Oh, I am learning every moment and every day. So lifelong learner. That's what leaders learner, do, right? That's what yeah. true leaders do. Yeah, lifelong learner is constantly learning. And I, I couldn't imagine life without learning. It is through learning that you grow and change and adapt. I mean, when we look back at the impact of the pandemic, those who are able to move through it with grace and succeed are those who are able to adapt. We're able to understand that this is a changing situation, to accept the change, to do what they can within it to help and support those around them, and to not fight for life to be like it was before because it's just not going to be. And so, you know, fundamental to who we are as, as humans that evolve, fundamental to our evolution as a species is the ability to grow and change and adapt that is predicated on the ability to learn. Right. And so for me, I am constantly learning and growing, whether it was the fight that I had with my husband yesterday because I didn't empty the dishwasher in which I learned what his needs were from me, in which I learned, you know, I have introspected and learned my own hesitations around having done that and then observed them, changed them and learned a new pattern, you know, learned a new habit, learned a new way of doing things. It is so utterly constant. You know, they say the one thing in your life that is constant is change. And if, if you roll with that change, if you absorb and adapt the change and adapt yourself, that is learning. Awesome. And so I, I couldn't imagine life without learning. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, Ariel, when you think of leadership today, what most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? There's oh, the very, very, very deep breath that we have to take when we think about the leadership of this country at the moment. And when I am most worried about leadership, it is people who are leading from a place of self-serving. Yes. And if you are leading because you want to be in power, if you are leading because you want to maintain power for you and you know your immediate let's not call them constituents you and your immediate group um then you have a leader who is not in power for the right reasons mm -hmm. you know the most important thing about leadership is your ability to serve the people that you are leading leadership is a very selfless act even though so many people look to leaders and think, oh, that's the guy on the top or the girl or the woman on top. Um, the point of being on the top is not to dominate and exert your power over others or to grow your own power. It is to give agency to the people who you are leading. It is to support and serve the people you are leading and the ends of all of these people, the good, the social and the common good. So my greatest concern is people who coerce their leadership or who use coercive means in their leadership to hold on to power 
you're leading for the wrong reason. Right. When you look at the future, what are you most hopeful about when you think of leadership? <laughs> I'm most hopeful that people who are leading for the wrong reasons are no longer leading. I really hope that both the leadership that's currently in power and the next generation of leaders can lead with compassion and grace and with the desire to truly help the people that they are leading and to truly help the larger society. And, and if the goals are to help the greatest good, not just the immediate good, but the greatest good, then you've got a great leader. Fantastic. And that has to be the defining question. Am I helping the greatest good with this action? Right. Yeah. You know, when you think of future leaders and think of the people who are listening to this, that's how we continue to develop. You don't attain that level of leadership, that preferred level of leadership or that effective and kind and serving level of leadership without asking that question of yourself now. And that's a practice, right? We have to practice that. It doesn't just happen. Yes. And mm -hmm. it's a constant question. How do I best serve the greater yes. good? Love it. All right. So Dr. Anita Sanchez wants to know, what gives you hope that then compels you to go into action to bring positive change? Oh, that's a great one. What gives me hope is the knowledge that change is possible. What gives me hope is having seen so much good. What gives me hope is the inherent good in people. What gives me hope is the technological advances that we have seen. What gives me hope is, you know, great leadership styles um, that have inspired and engaged teams of people to do wonderful things. Humans are amazing. We are extraordinary creatures. And when we're able to act in a way that engages the greater good and engages one another, we do extraordinary things. That's and so humans give me hope. I love that answer. And I love how you value people and are so curious about them. You have to be. I mean, we are all we each have. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are all people. And, and the greatest thing that gives us joy in life is typically being with other people. And so we have to hold each person as a precious gift. We have to, you know, feel that sense of engagement and support. because That's what makes us feel great as people. And as much as we want to be supported, we do that by supporting others. And when you have this network of support, we all just feel great. You know, we have all the pieces there for it to be awesome. When you look at a well-run company where people care about each other and support each other and, you know, love doing what they're doing and are seen as people or well-run classroom or system, like that's when everybody's happy and everyone's flourishing. And that is absolutely possible and it's not hard to do. It just requires setting up the preconditions of trust amongst a group of people. Mm -hmm. You know, Ariel, I love your passion, the passion that you bring into your work, the passion that you bring into leadership. Thank you so much. Now, as a listener of this podcast, what is a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? So something that I haven't spoken about yet is times when I've been a bad leader and things that I've learned by not being great as a leader. So that would be a question that I would put to someone else. What have you learned from times when you have not been a great leader? That is a great question. And I will forward that to the next leader, but you can respond to it if you want. It's up to you. Sure. I'm, I'm happy to share some stories. One of the things that happened when I was the CEO of Muse, I was the CEO for seven years and the company had gotten to a point where it was bigger than I had the skill set to manage. You know, we were very complex. We had millions and millions and millions of dollars in investment. We had manufacturing. We had a P&L to look after. We had a staff of 40 people. And it had gotten to the point where I didn't have the skills and ability to really be able to attend to all of these things in the best way. There was the things that I was great at doing, the things that I was weak at doing. And I, at that time, didn't recognize my weakness. You know, somebody needed to sort of tap me on the shoulder and point out blind spots. And that was a tremendous moment for me to really see what I still needed to learn and how I still needed to grow as a leader. And, you know, it's, it's incredibly humbling when you recognize that you 
are not necessarily great at the thing you're doing. You're great at some aspect of it, but not all, not all aspects of it. And so it became a real project for me to really understand my strengths and weaknesses and be able to fill in the gaps and fill in the spots and be able to give up the ego of needing to be the leader of everything. And I want to honor you, Ariel, because that takes work. That takes a knowing yourself or at least having people around you who can speak into your life and that you're open to that. And the being open to it is key. And, you know, it can hurt and it can sting, but that's okay. That is literally how we grow. You take feedback. You don't take it personally, but you take it as a part of you that can grow and develop. And as you allow that growth and development, that's when we become better leaders. That's when we become better humans. Right. But the process does suck sometimes. (laughs) Absolutely. It stings, it burns, it hurts. Right. Um, But you don't have to amplify that sting and burn and hurt. That's right. That's not what... You don't have to rinse and repeat again the same stuff. Yeah. That's great. So is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I'm good. You're good. All right. So Ariel, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. My sincere pleasure. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.